I'm just going to invite Mark Fisser on stage. <laughs> Thanks for having me, mate. Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> that is uh, incredible. Uh, Mark was just saying backstage, yeah, far out. That just reminded me of how freaking scary that was. <laughs> so, um, tell us a little bit about what we just saw. Uh, you just saw the, uh, the trailer of a project that we've been working on for some time now, and it's, uh, it's called Operation Deep Blue. And the theory was that there are bigger waves out there than what we see at our normal coastlines or predominant big wave spots. And, uh, and this whole mission was to, to prove that theory and to see if they really do exist. Okay. So we're talking about space here today. How can you relate your experience with space? It's an interesting question, but uh, I think when we first started this project, we had no idea how in-depth it really was. I, I literally just thought that there would be a couple of spots that you know, large waves would pass by that we could, that we could track and locate. Uh, and it's definitely not that easy. We, we had to work with scientists and um, people that gave us access to over 25 years of space data to, to locate these spots. And, and what we were looking for was a pattern of significant wave heights. And the, the, the height we're after was about uh, 30 metres, so that's 100 foot. And um, I asked the guys, I said, if you can, if you can find a pattern where there's a 100 foot wave has occurred more than once, that's, that's what I'm after, because I knew that every now and again there would be a rogue wave, but if it happened more than once, there would have to be some kind of underwater structure that would prove that to be you know, a, real, a real place or a real wave. Uh, after they researched and, and found some answers for me, I, I had about 12 locations that indicated there could be this type of wave there, and uh, it wasn't enough just to go off what a satellite image had said or the satellite data had said. I physically had to go out there and, and see with my own eyes. And, and a lot of these waves weren't surfable waves. In the surfing world, we call them you know, fat burgers or something that just doesn't break top to bottom. Um, it's not really a rideable wave and, and it's not really a wave that you, can, you would actually want to go and surf. You know, some of them had rocks all through the centre and might have been a beautiful peeling wave, but if you took off, you, you would just, um, you probably would die. <laughs> and, uh, and, and some of them didn't exist. Some of them just, just weren't what, what the data was telling us. So it was a really big learning curve, and, um, and of those spots, 
we were able to find uh, about three that I think are actual rideable waves. But to line that up with the perfect winds, the perfect swell direction, it's a once in a year kind of event. Pretty good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go personal as well with this because we get what you do. I think that is pretty clear. But um, to sort of get a bit of a behind the scenes understanding of, of what you go through, um, hitting, hitting up these questions of inner space. Um, and what comes to mind, I guess, is this shot here of, you know, what is going on? Oh, that, was, uh, that was a part where we're, you know, obviously preparing to go out and um, it was probably one of the most sort of terrifying feelings for me that, that I've ever had, you know, like uh, just before we we're about to leave, I was so scared. I was so nervous about the whole experience. Um, we'd done a lot of skydive training and nothing can prepare you for the moment that that, that back ramp of the plane opens and, and the sound just, just roars and, and all the air, everything that's in your little environment starts blasting out and you just, oh, just every awareness level and every little thing in, in your mind just is so heightened and um, you, you're pretty much freaking out. <laughs> Uh, so has has something gone wrong, and can you share on on the on the uh, one of the first training drills? We knew we had to make um, our experience as real as possible. So we we knew we had to experience exactly what it would be like landing out in the middle of nowhere. And um, the first the first drill for me was probably the absolute um, the worst. I think I, uh, I everything that could have possibly gone wrong, I think probably did from my end. Um, the uh, the jump master or the load master, he's the guy that does the hand signal at the end. He said, he said, Mark, I want you to help me push the ski out at the start. And I was like, okay, no worries. And uh, the moment that that green light flicked on, you know, and it was it was the go signal. I was helping him push it out, and I slipped on the side of like a panel because I was so scared and like nervous. I must have been sweating so much that inside my little rubber shoes it was really quite wet and I slid a bit and the plane flies on an angle to let everything slide out and I remember feeling like I was going to get sucked out of the plane and they said to me, the only way you guys can die is if you go straight out behind the ski because the parachutes will open in your face and it will kill you. So I was like, <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> make sure I don't do that. Um, but when, when that happened and I felt myself slide, my heart was just pounding and I, I basically had a sensory overload. And um, the moment I was given the signal to jump, the, uh, there was a carabiner that flicked off from the jet ski once it left and it nearly took my head off. It missed me by like a millimetre and I was just like, whoa, like twice in a couple of seconds I felt like I'd nearly died. <laughs> and, um, and they're giving me the signal, go, go, because every second you wait, the, uh, the cargo or the, the jet ski is, is blowing further away and it's harder to track it down in the air. So you, you just have to run and go. So you, the moment I ran out, I just looked into this deep blue space of just, you know, it just felt like nothing, you know. And um, everything that you could physically see, like normally, I couldn't see because I had such a strong sensory overload. Uh, just basic things had all evaporated from my, my normal vision and it was super intense. And, uh, and I remember... Once I pulled my parachute, one of my risers, which is the little things that you steer with, had got locked on one side, so I was turning in a hard, hard loop, and I was just like, you know, I was pretty much had enough that day. <laughs> and um, yeah, once I, once I sort of cleared that up, the whole team was directly below me, and there was a 360-degree three, three view of blue ocean, not another thing, piece of land or anything in sight, and I couldn't see a thing because I had such a strong, uh, I guess, like a semi-meltdown, really. And, um, yeah, and the, the guys were directly below me, and I was looking down, and something that could have been so close to me, I, I couldn't see it. And I remember thinking, like, you know, where am I? Like, I, where is everything? And, and it was just, it was such an intense um, moment. And I think that ties into our next question as well, touching on um, this feeling of isolation. Uh, can you touch on, on some of that? Yeah, I think, you know, the moment I got down to the ski and I and I'd looked around and I realised I was I was so insignificant, you know, like I there was if you look around and imagine that the whole entire you're in a globe, you, you know, that little thing that you shake up and you see the the little snowflakes fall down. I felt like I was in one of those with just pure blue. 
all around me and I just was like, well, I'm a tiny speck in this world. Like I just felt so insignificant and I just remember thinking um, I'm a long way from help if I ever need anything to. <laughs> yeah, that is, uh, that is serious. Uh, so I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, what's going on. What do you do with that fear? Uh, I think you can't control the fear, but you can you can accept it when it's coming to you. And what I guess I mean by that is when I felt fearful, um, there was nothing else I could do other than just my routine exit. And like I felt so scared that I was literally shaky in the legs and felt like I couldn't even stand on my own two feet, you know, especially when, when all that sort of stuff was happening. But the only way I could really deal with fear was was break it down into small pieces and just say, look, the next step is just to get out of the plane, have a clean exit, open that chute and, and just break it down step by step. So you can't really deal with it. You've just got to go through it. So to do this, to put yourself on the edge like this, uh, what have you got to prepare for? What, what do you run through? Training-wise for us, is, it's, uh, it's completely different to, to being a surfer as, as a normal surfer, which I used to do. I used to compete um, as a surfer and it's a totally different ball game. The group that goes, everyone has to be as switched on and knowledgeable in each area um, as, as the other person. Like Everyone had to know how to not only perform CPR but to be able to do it on a sled, which is a little rescue boy on the back of a jet ski. And, uh, do it out in the open ocean, how to cut through someone's wetsuit and you know, be prepared to just stab into your own mate and, uh, and do what it took to, to help them survive. We had to know how to put each other on, on a drip or, or put morphine into someone if we had to. And that kind of really opens your mind up to, okay, we're, we're really going to a different area here. Yeah, this isn't surfing <laughs> out the back. Yeah. Look, there's a, a few big questions I want to try and grab. Um, the first is, why do this? <laughs> um, you know, for me, that's an easy answer. I, I, it's what I want to do. I, I love exploring and I, you know, I love looking and trying to find what, what is out there. I think the, the ocean, the underwater ocean itself, 95% of it hasn't been discovered. When you think of that, you know, that's, that's a, a massive amount of water that people haven't even found or know anything about. So I think it would be really cool to go and discover that and, and see what is out there and see if these, these huge waves really exist. You know, it's, for me, it's like chasing that Loch Ness monster or whatever they call it. But <laughs> I, I really just want to explore and see what this world has to offer. Unreal. And that leads directly to our last question. And it's really that question that we ask um, at TED and TEDx is, what's your idea worth sharing? My idea worth sharing is... Um, I think everyone should just do what they want to do. Um, follow your dream. It's it's your life. At the end of the day, you know, I, I don't remember any previous lives and, and this is it right now. And Be everything and do everything that you want to do because we, we get one shot at it. So, yeah, make it happen. Wow. Thank you so much, Mark Visser. Thanks.